Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. Today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Professor Gautam Desi Raju, who is a structural chemist who has been in the solid state and structural chemistry unit of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, since 2009. Prior to this, he had been in the University of Hyderabad for 30 years. He has played a major role in the development and growth of the subject of crystal engineering. He is noted for gaining acceptance for the theme of weak hydrogen bonding. His books on crystal engineering and the weak hydrogen bond in structural chemistry and biology are well known. And he is one of the most highly cited Indian scientists. At present, he is the chairman of the governing council of the Bose Institute, Kolkata. So, Professor, really, really appreciate and I'm honored that you've taken time being part of the Humble Podcast. So, I'll, I'll start with this question, you know, because uh, physics, chemistry and biology, they are like the three trinity of sorts that creates our reality and life itself, you know. And physicists are working on particles, the interaction, uh, the, the, the way the particles interact in the quest to understand the universe and everything, you know, how everything has come about. Biologists, on the other hand, are working on understanding the process of life creation by probing what trillions of cells, DNA and its interaction with proteins are doing to bring about life. Could you talk about the role of chemistry in the creation of life? Very interesting question, Eddie. And uh, in one of my articles, I think maybe 15 years ago or something, I have called chemistry the middle kingdom as something which comes in between physics and biology. Chemi physics, if you say, physics was itself has come from mechanics which came from astronomy. And as you point out, it has to do with phenomena. And uh, why things are the way they are at a, from a very small to very big scales. But uh, to get to the actual business of living things, which is biology, you need something in the middle. And this something is actually a language. Chemistry is a language. It takes the phenomena and then puts it into the real world of biology by understanding or trying to figure out what the structure of matter is. So, somewhere else I've written too that all chemistry is structural chemistry. Uh, in chemistry, we're always trying to find out how, what things are made of, how they are made up. How are the things put together to get what we call matter? And uh, the code we use in chemistry is the periodic table, which is the 120 odd elements, which are non-creatable things. They exist and are of themselves throughout the universe. And by combining these things in various ways, we get what is called matter, essentially. So chemistry is, is sort of, a, that's why I call chemistry a language. It is the language of biology. And this also gets into an idea which is well known called reductionism. You see, the, the, the reverse argument was that chemistry is nothing. And that all of chemistry can be explained by the laws of physics. That's what Dirac said. And uh, because he said in chemistry, you are only looking at details. But physics is telling you uh, really what it's all about. 
So what does it matter whether it is this or that or something else? So that's not the case, in fact. Chemistry is not reducible to physics. And uh, simply because there are too many details in chemistry which cannot be accurately obtained by just solving equations in physics. Or we could solve those equations, but using computers and methodologies which may not be available for centuries. Now, when we are not yet there. So, chemistry that way is a science of approximations. That's another thing. And it is beautifully poised between the quantitative nature of physics and the qualitative nature of biology. The beauty about chemistry, which is one of the reasons I have often spoken, why so few students like chemistry? You know, it's not a popular subject. They, they go for physics, they go for biology. The reason I find that people don't like chemistry is that it is a very tantalizing subject which can be quantitative sometimes, it can be qualitative sometimes. And I find that good chemists are the ones who know when to be quantitative and when to be qualitative. The thing about chemistry and biology is that imagine that in the study of matter or study of reactions or whatever it is, there is something called diversity. How different, how diverse are all the phenomena, the various things that you are looking at? And then how complex is something? That is, various phenomena or reactions or compounds, what kind of hierarchy, internal hierarchy do they have? And what relationship do all these levels have with each other? So usually you will find that in chemistry, we go very high in diversity. I mean, we've got 120 elements. So the way in which we can put these together is practically infinite. Today, somebody told me that something like some 20 million compounds have been made or something. It's a huge number. Now, biology, on the other hand, is not very diverse, but it's very complex. In biology, the biological molecules, talk if you want to talk periodic table language, is mostly 99% carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, bus. Just four elements. Okay, for decoration, you have another 20 elements, which, by the way, are quite important. Without those other 20, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be life as we knew it. But it is mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. So in terms of diversity, the kinds of molecules which play around in biology, it's not very diverse. But the degree of complexity is enormous. In fact, chemists go on struggling in the lab to try to reproduce some things that nature seems to do very, very easily. You know, so we are nowhere near nature in terms of matching the complexity that she has. So since you asked this question, this is, the, I think, in my view, the relationship between physics, chemistry and biology. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for sharing your insight. Yes, I think there is some fantastic things happening, though you pointed out that, you know, students are, are not really excited towards the field of chemistry. But I, I, I guess, you know, what's happening is, is that all of these fields are merging the way the, the new researchers are looking at things. We're getting in a very, very exciting space. Now, you've been in the field of chemistry for, for ages. Would you like to share a little bit about your challenges over the years? What you've been working on? Now. When you say challenges, I, some, somebody once told me jokingly, they said, you create most of your own challenges. So I, I think it is like that. In fact, some of my work and all that, mm, picking my research problems and so on. I always tell people that researchers, it's, you don't have to find correct answers, but you have to pose the correct questions. And what we don't know how to do properly in India, especially, we don't know because we can't question at all. We don't know how to question. We don't know how to question properly. I mean, we question, but we question all sorts of stupid ways in social media and all. You should only show your idiocy by asking those questions. We don't know, you know, what is the kind of question that needs to be asked in research. And that, that's where I find. So challenges mean 
my challenges came in the work because you there is one aspect of this thing called hydrogen bonding and all which you mentioned weak hydrogen bond or something so this weak hydrogen bond was a challenge i gave myself because everybody thought that hydrogen bonds are strong but somehow something told me that that was too harsh a description there were hydrogen bonds that were a little fuzzy not so strong etc etc so hydrogen bonds i felt all don't need to be strong so there was evidence it was not something that uh, i just got from the top of my head there was evidence but people just didn't think too much about that evidence they never felt it is so important or something like that so then this whole idea of trying to establish that hydrogen bonds need not be so strong Uh, so that book which i wrote in 1999 was sort of the end of that whole project by which time practically everybody recognized that hydrogen bonds could be weak and subsequently i have tried to show in some of my things that they can be weak 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 very weak also and still show the properties of the some of the strong hydrogen bonds so then this also leads to a different sort of idea you know i said chemistry is all about structure but chemistry is also about properties and this whole relationship between structure and property this is very important in chemistry that means do you know how something behaves based on what it is is there a one to one correspondence between structure and property that means if the structure is different as the property become different in the beginning people felt it's like this that if structure is different property must be different if property is different structure must be different this is only partly true today and we said about chemistry and all subjects coming together becoming complex and big and all that much it's part of that i mean what really happens now is that you can have the same structure with different properties you can have the same property with different structures so all these things are happening because chemistry has now become a study of complex systems not simple systems this weak hydrogen bond was a sort of a beginning of a whole movement in chemistry in around 1990 or so which started with something called supra molecular chemistry and uh, my my own subject crystal engineering and all which i developed was based around the supra molecular chemistry which said that the property of a collection of objects ha huh, is not necessarily just the aggregate of all the individual properties so if you have a number of things put together and each of them have some individual properties the property of the aggregate it can be more than all those individual properties just added up so there is some extra some x factor something gets added on and what gets added on that is the same thing that detail you lose when you reduce chemistry to physics and the moment you reduce that and then you lost it then you lost everything which means that dirac can definitely say he is wrong because he, chemistry cannot be reduced to equations but again coming back to what you are saying this complexity this is very much a part of today's situation because chemistry is a complex subject this morning i was talking with one of my colleagues about uh, solar energy conversion and all that that brings in you know physics chemistry engineering all you need to know all three quite well and no one person can know all these three so you need now teams of people working and in india we are very poor at team work we like to work as individuals so the moment you start requiring things where teams have to come together it becomes very very difficult right right so professor you opened up a couple of things you know i mean you you mentioned about india the lack of teamwork i think you know that's that's a global phenomena it's not just india largely india i guess because i we, we don't realize the importance of working together you know we we working in silos thinking that you know we'll patent things you know create products and in that way we not accelerating technology i think the only way we can you know science technology innovation if you, can, you grow this is is when there's team work you know rather than you know the, the working in silos you also mentioned about asking the need to ask deeper questions i i i guess we as humans are always you know we block ourselves for being ridiculed i mean 
can I ask this question? Would I look stupid if I ask this question? And you know, the, the need to ask these questions is so important, especially in a day, I mean, in a time such as now, where there's some insane things happening in the space of technology. Crystal engineering, you have been someone who's vested in this and pioneering that space. Could you kind of unpack uh, uh, crystal engineering? And, and and also you you mentioned about weak hydrogen bonding. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. What has been the learning so far from uh, your deep dive into uh, uh, crystal engineering? And and possibly explain the process of engineering those crystals because I think it, it, uh, it it's the core is there. How do you engineer them? Uh, when I say crystal engineering, I must qualify that initially and so on, crystal meant molecular crystals or organic crystals, uh, not crystals of things like diamond, sodium chloride, uh, silicon, etc., which are purely inorganic. So, basic difference between a molecular crystal and what we call ionic crystals is that in a molecular crystal, you have something called a molecule. A molecule is a collection of atoms which are held together by fairly strong bonds called covalent bonds. So any organic molecule like naphthalene, glucose, benzene, you know, things like that are what come under the ambit of crystal engineering. Now, crystal engineering, how a crystal is put together, it can be called like a sociological phenomenon. So you have a molecule. A molecule is, is floating away somewhere in space and then there is another molecule somewhere floating. Then in the process of crystallization, these molecules come together. Now, when they come together to form what physics, physicists would call a condensed phase or what a chemist would call as a solid or as a crystal, how exactly do they come together? Now, I can give you with a very simple graphical illustration. So, suppose this is one molecule huh? and then this is another molecule. Okay, these are both floating around somewhere in space. Now, when they come together, you see they can come in one of two common ways. One is like this with the two molecules roughly pointing 90 degrees at each other. You see this? The other way they can come together is like this, with them parallel like this. So these are the two very standard methods in let us say some long molecules will start approaching each other. Both of them happen about equally frequently. So when do you get the former case with this 90 degree thing? And when do you get the latter case with this parallel thing? The answer to such a question can be obtained by looking at the small interactions between the various atoms in these two different molecules. So based on these little, little things and how they all add up, remember what I told you that the sum total can be more than the aggregate of all those things. That comes in now. So the sum total sometimes will take you here, which is one outcome, this is perpendicular. Sometimes the sum total will take you here. The, the thing, the beautiful thing about this is there is no halfway house. So that slowly, 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 slowly you see something like this and gradually it's becoming like this. No. That sometimes there is one no man's land. It will now not be there in the middle. It'll either be this or it'll be this. 95% huh, of the cases is one of these two. So why? So these are the sorts of questions that crystal engineers ask. But unless you know the basic grammar and ground rules of how molecules come together, you will not be able to engineer those molecules. Now suppose I come and tell you, you know, Eddie, I only want this structure. I don't want this one. Because this particular structure is going to give me some nice property that I want. Okay. So I want to engineer the structure so that it comes like this. You got it? So how do I load that molecule? How do I fine tune that molecule 
so that it just goes one way and doesn't go the other way. That is crystal engineering. Now you said hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond, especially the weak one, comes in. I've already given you a hint. I said there are these little, little interactions between those two pencils that I put. This hydrogen bonds and weak hydrogen bonds are some of these interactions. So the better you understand those weak hydrogen bonds, the more control you have in the engineering process. If you don't understand that interaction, obviously you're not going to be able to use it properly enough in this whole exercise. So if you know all the interactions, the toolkit of the engineer, if you know all the interactions very nicely, then you can use it properly. Then you can do precise things. I can, instead of saying something very crude like this and that, I can say what happens when you get the third molecule? Where does it go vis-a-vis -vis these two? And then the fourth, then the fifth, and then finally infinite number, which is the crystal itself. Because crystal means that it's a huge number of molecules. So then the other interesting question in crystal engineering is, if I take two, is two a good model for three? Or the moment I put the third one, these two things both vanish and some third thing comes, maybe like three, like a triangle or something. We don't know. So each case, you have to sort of think very carefully and see what you're doing. And once again, you come to the interactions. Again, once again, you come to those same elements, carbon, hydrogen, because organic means carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, same molecules of bio biology. as They are the elements of organic chemistry. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, little bit, few halogens, chlorine, something, bromine. For tadka, you can add. That's all. But basically, it is a small number of elements which can commute, permute and combine in infinite number of ways. India only picked up crystal engineering many years after USA, Germany, Japan, UK, Italy. All these countries uh, picked up this subject much, much faster than India. In India, it came very, very grudgingly. Maybe partly because of jealousy, partly because of politics, and maybe partly. Because, but then you again said, you know, about teams and all that. Like, I don't believe it's a worldwide phenomenon. I think in India, we are uniquely unable to work as teams. This phenomena of working in silos, you, you're saying it, it's largely in India. Is that what you're hinting at? India, to some extent, Asia. But I think the Chinese have learned how to work together. Uh, we... Culturally, this we don't have this, or it could be just a scarcity phenomenon because the top of any pyramid in India is so small that everybody becomes a rival. So people are very nervous, almost scared to cooperate, collaborate. You know, at least a third of my papers have been collaborative papers. In, in other words, there is a principal investigator from some other group and we have worked together because usually when you do that in India, some committee or something says that uh, you've worked with some other guy and especially if that other guy is a foreigner, they'll say, no, no, he had all the ideas, you did nothing. So very, very quickly they say that. And uh, I think people are so scared and the pie is so small in India, Eddie, so that... Uh, this is now culturally it's become ingrained in us. We need some more time to come out of this mentality. But uh, to understand all these things, I think we still need some time. Right. We are not, right. Yet, we are not yet mature as a, a scientific community. Right. Maybe, maybe I double you on that because you mentioned about how China is taking that approach of a complete collaborative uh, workforce and, and and there's benefits of that. And that's there was plain to see in, you know, when, when COVID happened, you know, normally when you create a vaccine, it, it takes almost like a four to an eight year approach. I mean, to, you know, build a working virus and distribute it amongst, you know, the, the, the people in the pharma industry. Now, this was done in, in a six months time, largely because of the collaboration, you know, we all collaborated and, and the, the way I mean, in the beginning of the conversation also, maybe I was not not articulate enough to say that there there is something which is going on where everything is converging. And this is what I've been noticing, you know, even through the podcast, where the, the, when I interview people, 
everything is merging or converging you know when when we talking about uh, talking to a biologist or you talking about talking to an uh, engineer who's looking at uh, uh, you know neuroscience computation neuroscience they 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 leveraging of each other and, and and i guess that's the only way we'll be able to build technology or innovation which will be for the larger good even this new thing called the metaverse or web trio the entire ethos of it is uh like an openness and interoperability i mean though i mean i've, I've digressed a little bit but i guess the, the, the no, no, it's, it's not a, it's not a digression i think you are mentioning a very important point see one of the things is why why it has happened in china the, the whole system is different suppose uh, see this collaboration was imposed from above suppose you say i'm only going to fund projects where people, different groups work together no we don't have the guts to do that in india you know because immediately there'll be a howl from individual andolan jeevis you know they will start shouting so you will not be able so where it can happen is industry and in india in industry it does happen in indian industry part of the reason our phd students resist so much in joining an industry is that they don't want to work under a direction from the top suppose the top management tells you that a b c d e all you five people please work together and come up with this thing in six months time indians don't like that so they would rather sit in an academic department and do nothing go to sleep they somehow feel that that freedom is being upheld this is a bunk freedom this is nothing the freedom to go to sleep unless people work together you are not going to be able to solve today's the world today is the issue of complexity so you cannot solve it in the methods of the 19th century or the 20th century also that 20th century was this old old method to to this the 21st century so we've got to think more in, in these lines but india mein to ho jayega but i think we st still st st too much too much of garbage and debris in our minds so you've said something so very profound and i hope the listeners take this that you know we we are in the 21st century but we still our, our mindset is still trapped in the 1920s we need to move with the time and i guess that's the only way we'll be able to create science tech and innovation and, and you know something which is truly global now i tell you i tell you i tell you to continue this i i, I think i know why it is like that because for most of the 20th century india was a desperately poor country uh, everything was scarcity determined scarcity economy so in such a situation of abject poverty for all uh, people fear change it's not that they want to work alone or they don't want to work together or something they just say are if i work with him and he takes away all the credit and runs away with it then uh, i'll be left nowhere and i would have given him something and i would be made a fool so that fear is so great that it acts as, and that fear is there on both sides also it's not just from one so that's why it's not it will not happen so so coming back to the, the, the chemistry part what is the current state of the art in technology of observing and manipulating the structural and functional properties of chemistry very nice it's a very good state now because the equipments and the apparatus and the various things you need they are becoming cheaper more widespread i mean crystal engineering can you believe is now taken root even in countries like africa in sub saharan africa and all there are people doing crystal engineering today places where there is no proper electricity 10 years ago so i think definitely this linking up of science and technology especially with crystal engineering devices properties marketable products all this is going to uh, was just participating in uh, a webinar a group in england is uh, now actually using crystal engineering to uh, uh, make detergents you know uh, so that uh, the detergents don't lose all the fizz and carbon dioxide in storage so they are using orthodox principles of crystal engineering to make a product that has got a longer shelf life and it is already hitting the market in uk 
So there are immediate practical applications everywhere. So I think that is we are we're in a good shape. And today that globalization is also helping. What happens in UK or Germany? I mean, inevitably the Indian industry will pick it up. They may not be anymore in that kind of frame that you know we have to just borrow all the technology and all that. You mentioned in the course of the conversation that chemistry as a subject is not so likable by by the students or, or, or the younger generation. But you you mentioned that you know this crystal engineering or uh, in chemistry uh, field as large is creating some real world applications and the, the, these real world applications are across different sectors of industries so could you kind of like specify and share those those examples or, or places or industries where crystal engineering have really created real world benefits you know by giving giving a few examples on the applications solar energy catalysis uh, separation separation of gases for example, sometimes there's a mixture of gases and uh, one you want and the other one you don't want. So it's very difficult to separate them using other means. So if you can make a special crystal that acts as a sort of a sieve that will retain one and then let, let the other one pass through, that is another application. Then there is another application in terms of in general chemical manufacturing. Much of this is done in solution, so which means you're using some solvent, which may not be water. It may be a harmful organic solvent. So if you can conduct reactions by grinding in the solid state, by just roasting things together, uh, all this involves engineering of crystals of certain types. Then if you can avoid solvent, then the implications for green chemistry and all are quite tremendous. So I would say it's a variety of things. Pharma and catalysis are the big ones now where you can where you're actually seeing products and all in it. In pharma, we've got many products in the market. So it's no more a hypothetical thing. Uh, but uh, uh, other areas, I think uh, solar energy, it's definitely it's coming because especially in the uh, 15, 20 years, the importance of oil and petroleum will come down quite a lot. And uh, the importance of solar energy will really go up. So we have organic uh, competition to say silicon, uh, which still now looks like a dream. But, you know, science moves fast and uh, suddenly something will happen. And then the beauty of science is it's quite unpredictable sometimes. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's the core. I mean, you know, the beauty of science is completely, completely unpredictable. So so what, what, what comes next to you? What's your future roadmap? I got hooked on to the Constitution of India. And I started looking at that document and began to see that there were many, many big problems in that document and the fact that we are making so many mistakes today in what we are doing, I could trace back to that. Well, the long and short of it is that uh, I wrote a book which is going to come out in about 20 days time and it's called Bharat India 2.0 and it talks about the constitution, the good things about it, the bad things about it, where it can be mended where it can be amended, where it has to be changed, and what are the kinds of solutions. Because I found that uh, it is a fallacy to say that only social scientists and humanities types should even look at things like the Indian constitution and so on. Look, I am as much of a citizen of this country as a social scientist or a economist or a historian or a linguist or you or anybody else. And just because I am a scientist, who's a pretty serious scientist at that, doesn't mean that I am prohibited from thinking or talking about the constitution. It's my constitution also. And it is in that spirit that I wrote the book. It's been um, looked at very favorably by some of the people whose names come on the blurbs in the back of the book. But uh, look out for Bharat India 2.0, which should be on Amazon in about a month from now. Thank you, sir, for taking time and being part of the podcast. Yes, I think we are living in an excellent point of time in human history, especially in India, 1.3 billion people. We've got so much opportunity. You, a scientist, are now writing a book on India, India's constitution. This is something which I'm really, really looking forward for. The researchers, the scientists should be given a voice, which is an open voice, open for debate, open for questioning the wrongs, and, and only if we have an atmosphere which is 
open science and technology will flourish and and we, we need to collaborate largely together because like you mentioned in the course of conversation you know everybody is working in silos and 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 the the future is asking for us to all join together because all of these technologies are getting so complex and and the only way we can create something which is truly remarkable is when we collaborate and and we take an interdisciplinary approach and take the best from both the worlds you know reach out to all the other players and say okay okay can we take that person's help and and build build the future i hope that india does that i hope the world does that because we 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 sitting in an exciting point of time and, and we can create awesomeness if if we come together i'm really looking forward for this new book bharat india 2.0 and i, I and i'm sure a, a book coming from a scientist on on constitution on reinventing india reinventing or taking a complete fresh perspective our mindset is stuck in the 1920s when we are living in the 21st century so i hope my listeners also understand the need to kind of move with, with the new and and that's the only way we'll be able to build better future so you know that's somebody said very famous said i forgot he said it is not a sin to be wrong but he said it is a sin to aim too low you know i think that is what our young scientists or aspiring scientists there's a single take home you know that i want to tell them is that it's not a sin to be wrong it's a sin to aim too low what a profound note to end on thank you sir really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast uh, if it, to my listeners if you like what you see in here then please press the subscribe button until next time see you guys sir thank you sir really appreciate this thank you thank you very much indeed baby nice talking to you